Good afternoon. I'm Dane Haugen. As the Alpha Rho Chapter of Sigma Pi Fraternity's Project Officer, I'm here, along with Sean Lynch, to present the award for the 2008 Dr. Michael N. Compton Public Affairs Essay Contest. Dr. Compton was one of the prime founders for the Institute of Development of Ethics and Leadership, or as we call it, IDEAL. IDEAL is a nonprofit organization established by Missouri State Sigma Pi alumni to teach ethics and leadership to the undergraduate members of our chapter. Before he died in 2014, Dr. Compton stated that his desire to see IDEAL support the public affairs mission of MSU. This contest is a vehicle we use to accomplish his desire and honor his memory. This contest heightens interest in each year's public affairs theme and this spring's conference among the undergraduate students of Missouri State University. The contest is coordinated and funded by IDEAL, the active chapter promotes the contest, and the university administers the contest. We would like to acknowledge the cooperation of all the college deans in our efforts to promote this contest. We are happy to note that we doubled the amount of entries from last year to this year, and we had entries from colleges we had never had entries from before. We also want to say thank you to Associate Provost Dr. Rochelle Darabi and the Office of the Public Affairs Support for enabling us to run such an effective competition. In particular, we want to note the efforts of Stacy Trawatha Bach in administering the contest and coordinating the judging. Thank you, Stacy. The grand prize for this contest is $500 cash for the author of a winning essay. Presenting this award is our chapter president, Easton Haas. Before we announce the winner, we want to say thank you to everyone who competed in this year's contest. We had a lot of excellent entries, and choosing a winner was very difficult. This year's winner is Delaney O'Donnell, a senior animal science major from Henrico, Virginia. The author of the winning essay also receives a $500 cash prize for a donation to the charity or nonprofit of their choosing. Delaney chose to donate to the Equilibrium Therapy Center located in Rogersville, Missouri. This is one of the largest equine assisted therapy services in the state. Accepting the donation on their behalf is executive director and founder Kent Crumpley. Thank you. Congratulations to Delaney O'Donnell and the Equilibrium Therapy Center. May we have a round of applause recognizing their efforts. Thank you very much. We look, we'll be back next year with an even bigger and better competition.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike Burton. I'm serving as the chair of the Public Affairs Conference this year, and it's been my great blessing to work with our administrators, staff, faculty, and students to put together what we hope you've found to be an exciting program already. Anybody participated in, a, in one of the panels yet this morning? or the event last night with Dr. Ballard. Very good, thank you. Continue, I hope that you will find this to be illuminating and exciting and that you'll have the opportunity to even interact with our panelists. I know that they are eager for that as well. As you know, most universities around the country find two or three things that they'll want to brag about on their website to demonstrate their commitment to their communities. At Missouri State University, we of course have the public affairs mission and we hope that all of our students will be more than exposed yeah. to the priorities of the public affairs mission, but they will come to embrace it. So that you will leave here having been trained in ethical leadership, that you will have competence with other cultures, and of course, finally, that you will engage in your community. Now, you will see this modeled in the panels, and many of you who have participated in the panel program so far this morning will have noticed that there's at least one expert on the panel, and then another two or three persons who are simply informed citizens. We do this so that we can make them uncomfortable. I'm joking. The, the goal is not to make our panelists uncomfortable, but rather for you all to see the importance of being an informed citizen, that you have an opinion, a perspective, and that you have some choice to make. So it may be that one day in the future that you'll be serving on one of these panels. We draw heavily on our alumni. So I hope that you will see that your role as an informed citizen is in part lifting up the educational experience of others. And I hope that you'll take that seriously. I hope you take the conference seriously. I hope you also enjoy the expertise of the persons that we're about to hear from. Now in a moment we'll hear from Mr. Ron Ireland on the topic that you're all here to, to listen to, but in order to provide an appropriate introduction, Dr. Courtney Pham from Business will be able to provide uh, a proper introduction. Courtney? Thank you, Dr. Burton. Um, I, my name is Courtney Pham. I'm from the College of Business and I teach marketing. Um, so. Ron and I go way back, and a lot of people are like, like, how way back? And I'm like, well, uh, at least four or five years, because <laughs> every time um, he does come to visit Springfield, I always try to snack a couple of hours of his time to come to my class to speak. Uh, and this year, uh, it's, it's a great joy to, to see that he was able to accept our invitation to come and be our plenary speaker. Um, and so I, I would like to say something about him that a lot of people don't know, um, is that he is a, an alumni of MSU. Back then, it was not MSU. It was um, SMS, uh, it's, it's Southwest, Missouri, Southwest State. Missouri State University. Mm -hmm. And he was on the tennis team. And I um, thought, well, that's kind of neat. And I found some pictures of him back then. Um, but after a, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, after I, <laughs> I, after I tried to find it, that it was too late, so I, I didn't have that, but um, I just thought it, it's very unique. Um, but Ron has 37 years of experience in business, and he's one of the visionary founder of the, um, of the uh, supply chain management, uh, the um, collaboration. Um, and so he was awarded the Walmart IT Visionary of the Year in 19, 1995 uh, for his design and implementation of award-winning Walmart Automated Replenishment Planning. Uh, and then from there, he went on to be the industry leader and expert uh, in the standard that's called Collaboration Planning, Forecasting, and Replenishment, and we call that short CPFR. Um, also, Wall Street also um, referred to him as the Will Rogers of the supply chain. Um, he's the guy who brings the simplicity and humor to complex and supply chain um, issues. Um, he's a sought after speaker at MIT, Harvard, Yale, uh, but today uh, I am very happy that he's willing to come back to his automata and, um, and he is going to share with us 
uh, some of the sustainability uh, in the supply chain. Uh, and please welcome Mr. Ron Ireland. Thank you. Thanks, Courtney. Well, good afternoon. I was just, we were talking earlier, it's been uh, since 1974 that I used to come to this building and uh, go bowling. And I heard you still have the bowling alley down here. And uh, I'm glad you didn't have the pictures of me back playing tennis, because I was a lot thinner back then. And I have a good friend of mine, Danny Carell's in the audience, and he remembers me with hair down to here and a mustache. And uh, so a lot different than that. So anyway, thanks for uh, coming. Uh, this is a very exciting subject on my part. And I'm really glad that I was invited to talk to you about uh, the supply chain and the extended supply chain and how it impacts sustainability. So if we just start with a simple diagram of what a supply chain is, and it can go from gathering raw materials, whether it's wood for paper products or uh, petroleum, you know, the raw materials that we use in a supply chain and how that interacts with suppliers who might be making packaging material or, or our component parts for manufacturers and down to our transportation that we have, those, all those trucks you're seeing on Interstate 44. And do you realize that half those trucks tend to be empty or half, less than half full that you see on the highway? And so you're talking about sustainability and the cost of, of waste and everything that goes on in there. That's very much a passion of mine. All the way down to, they call it a customer here, but that could be a retailer, uh, could be a cu the customer of these. And then certainly us in this room is the end consumer. So if we look at the supply chain, pretty straightforward, but it gets complex to the point where it causes a bullwhip effect in supply chain. So if I go look up here to the consumer sales, so that's us. That's us going shopping, whether it's for cars or for toothpaste. We find that our predictability of what we buy is fairly easy to do, especially at an aggregate level, that we can forecast the demand for the consumption of, let's say, toothpaste. We can forecast that demand on average around 95% accurate, looking a month out. But when we share that demand and the orders through that supply chain, instead of being this flat demand up there, it starts to have amplifications, what we call a bullwhip effect, and all these bumps and rises that don't conform to the smoother consumer demand is considered waste. It could be excess inventory, emergency runs, um, air, air, air shipping products, you know, nothing like having to air ship toothpaste to someone versus being able to ship it by, by uh, truck or whatever. So when we start to get these amplifications, that is where a lot of money is wasted and a lot of, you know, issues on global warming or you know, air pollution or whatever we want in sustainability, that's where a lot of waste occurs, is that we disconnect from what the true consumer demand is through the various links of the supply chain. Now this is compounded because all of us in this room tend to shop with these little devices. And so it's just been in the last few years where we use our iPhones, and it's called omni-channel because now we no longer go to physical brick and mortar stores to buy our products, but if you're like me, I buy quite a few of my products online and very seldom go to stores for a lot of things, and now we've got to predict that consumer demand coming from our iPhones or through brick and mortar stores or other places I might shop. So it compounds these issues of this bullwhip effect going on within the supply chain. One of the things that I've found when I've consulted all these years, and I've worked in 35 different countries, 
uh, with the who's who of companies around the world, the Fortune 500 companies and smaller companies. And part of the visits that I do with them, we call a diagnostic. And one of the main questions I always ask the executives, I said, you know, tell me what your company does best. And normally you would think that if I ask that question, they're going to say, oh, we really make great products. Uh, we're good innovators. Uh, we're really good in that. But the number one answer that I get from the executives of these companies is that we fight fires really well. We constantly are firefighting, but we've got great people. And you kind of sit back thinking, you know, that's really true, because when you ask people, and I imagine a lot of you in this room would know that when you go into work uh, and you have a plan for the day of what you're going to work on, something's going to happen that prevents you either from working on that or not being able to spend as much time on that because you got surprised. You had some fire, some emergency pop up, and this tends to be an everyday occurrence, especially in our supply chain, but I think it happens in all industries as we're constantly fighting fire. We're always working emergencies. So some of that result is, when you look at it, is inefficient transportation. I already mentioned the trucks on the highway and how many of them are empty. There was a, a collaborative transportation group. That's what I like about your competitions that you had here. I went to one in uh, Denver and saw the, comp the competitors from different universities competing at that. And I believe it was uh, a gentleman from J.B. Hunt Trucking that was talking about how empty a lot of the trucks are on the highway. Uh, it's because of what they call backhauls or lack of backhauls where they drop their loads off and then once they drop their load off, that truck, that trailer is going back to where it needs to go, it's home base or whatever, and it's empty or it might only be half full. So they're trying to work on collaborative transportation so they can share loads and, and try to get these trailers filled up more often. So that initiative's going on in a collaborative environment. So you can see uh, modes of transportation. It's a lot cheaper if I use rail than it is to use airplanes. And uh, I was even, when one company selling oil <clears throat> and their they had some customers that were running out of cases of oil, and they were actually shipping oil to them using FedEx. You know, so I'd call that a lost leader. You know, losing money besides all the inefficiencies there. Certainly manufacturing issues, poor inventory management, daily firefighting, a huge impact on sustainability. So if we can focus our change on the consumer, then what we'll have here is a communication that's integrated between all the various links of the supply chain that if we all spend our attention on the end consumer, then maybe we can start to smooth that bullwhip effect, have visibility of it. And this is what's kind of new in our industry because a lot of retailers, you know, and I came out of Walmart a lot of our focus was more on our distribution centers versus what's actually happening on, in the stores. And Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart, used to say, you know, if you mind your pennies, the dollars would take care of themselves. And so back in the early 90s, when I was brought into Walmart, my challenge that was given to me is say, hey, Ron, why don't you try to smooth the bullwhip effect and so I implemented a process at the time called vendor forecasting, where we forecasted every product and every uh, store for the next 52 weeks what they're going to sell. 150 million store item combinations that we were forecasting the consumer demand by store, by product, and we were sharing that with our suppliers. Now that's way too much information, so you can aggregate that up, and that's the great things about the internet and being able to have access to this data, is to say, if I can share that consumer demand with the various links in the supply chain, maybe we can start making decisions a little more proactively versus reactive, 
and collaborate within those processes. So the idea is to take that true demand and put it across the various links and try to eliminate the bullwhip effect, all those wastes. One of the things that we come across is organizations internally are not very well integrated. Uh, collaboration internally is hard to do. It's sort of like uh, me collaborating uh, with you know, close relatives or families. It's hard to do. Internal collaboration is a lot harder to do than external collaboration. And when I get into this area and I look at companies through these diagnostics, I see this kind of mishmash here that everyone's going their different directions. You've got sales going over here, you've got manufacturing going over here, you've got finance, they're doing their own thing. Everyone's playing. I said I kind of relate this to kindergarten soccer. You know, it's called bunch ball. They all just kind of chase the ball. They don't have positions. They don't, they're just trying to get the ball in the goal. You might see little Johnny over there playing in the grass. He's not even in the game. But the whole idea here is to get them more aligned, more like a professional soccer team where we have strategies, we have goals, we have positions that if I'm going to like kick the ball over here, I've already got someone running to that position, that spot, before I actually even kick it. And so the idea here is in a, within an internal organization is to say, how do I align myself like this? I had someone say, well, this reminds me of a flock of geese, where the head goose, if it turns, everyone else turns. And I know at Walmart, we used to say, we could turn this mighty battleship as if it's a speedboat and be able to react really quick. Made it tough to work at Walmart because it was like, scream if you want to go louder because sometimes it turned a lot. And so it caused us to really work a lot of extra hours to do that. But the idea is how do I integrate my processes, taking it away from bunch ball where everyone's kind of taking care of themselves as individuals or as individual departments, and how do we work together as a team and to be able to, to, set, to satisfy our consumer demand working as a team, not only internally, but also with our trading partners. What happens is you've got these three processes, and I don't know if you guys have heard this before, it's pretty common in business to talk about people, processes, and tools. So we have to look at what are the people, are they trained, what kind of behaviors do they have, do we have formal processes on defining what their roles are, their, what are they supposed to do, their accountabilities. So do we, you know, I'm trying to get all these individual bunch ball players to understand what their position is and, and get them trained for that. And then what software, technology, or tools do they need to help do that better? And so when we look at it, a lot of companies will form initiatives and have different initiatives to try to fix some of their issues. Uh, I worked for a company, we all had little badges and stuff called Project Challenge. And so you'll see a lot of companies that they're going to have the initiative of the year or five initiatives of the year. And they're trying to really put together some buzz type things to fix some of these problems. And when they end up doing it, a lot of times they'll say, well, you know, our biggest problem is, is we have really bad computer systems. You know, a tool will fix everything we've got. And they leave the processes out here. So they said it can't be our processes. People, we have great people. People are really good. They're, they've got good behaviors, good manners. But the processes, oh, that's not important as long as we have good people and we have computers that can actually do all that thinking for us. The old garbage in, garbage out syndrome, right? We can have the best computers in the world, but if we don't have this together, so we've got this issue. If I have old processes plus new technology, 
it equals EOP. Any guess on what EOP stands for? So I've got old processes, I've got a new computer system, and it equals EOP. Any guess? And the answer is expensive old processes. In other words, I can make my mistakes a lot faster and bigger. When I worked at Martin Marietta Aerospace, I was head of IT for manufacturing, building Titan rockets. And I remember uh, we were building a duplicate Titan rocket by mistake. That's expensive. Fortunately, we, the government was our partner, so we just charged them for it. But, you know, isn't that crazy to think that the computer is always right, and yet it's garbage in, garbage out? And I can't, I've got so many stories I can tell with companies that have gone there and it installed these expensive processes only to find that their tool of choice is Excel spreadsheets because they can't use the computer. They can be trained on how to sign on, and I'll see them over there on Excel spreadsheets calculating what the orders need to be and then go over to that multi-million dollar system and type in the answer. It's crazy, but that's because they lack the proper processes. We also have found that when you look at it, we talk about me being a tennis player. If you've played tennis before, golf, any sport, you have the sweet spot. You know, it really feels good if you hit it in the sweet spot, like on a tennis racket. That's the middle here. That's where I've integrated my people. I've got them educated, trained on what's best practices, how they do their job, what's the processes that support. They know their position. They know what they do. They are fully integrated in the processes, and we provide them the right tools so they can do that job. That's the sweet spot in a business. When we talk to our clients and say, after you've gone through all this, you've drank the Kool-Aid, you've listened to Ron and the other guys talk about these good things to do, when they sit back and they say, what's most important in your business to adopt? They said, well, really, the most important thing is to make sure our people are trained and we have the right processes. And the tools, they're just a minor part of this, where so many companies will go off and buy multi-million dollar ERP systems, enterprise resource planning systems. They'll buy them without thinking about the other part and then find out that they use less than 10% of the functionality because they lack the other. So just a point says you can't tool yourself out of this. Our goal, just like a jigsaw puzzle, is to put this in these uh, pieces in proper order. So the very first thing we always do is put in the corner pieces. So you want to have one agenda and one set of numbers. So many companies I'll go into and I'll say, well, let, show me your numbers on your demand for your products. And every department tends to have their own set of numbers. I'll see the CFO, the finance guy, will have his set of numbers, what he thinks the business is going to do. Sales will have their numbers. Marketing will have their numbers. Supply chain, manufacturing, customer service. They'll all have their numbers, and they won't even add up. They don't even come close to adding up. And you're going, like, how in the world do I have an integrated business process when we internally can't even agree on what we're doing or what we're measuring. So one of the corner pieces is how do we just get to one set of numbers that we all can agree to? Can we have processes that everyone follow? Do we have ownership? Who owns the process? Can we keep to our plans? Can we do what we said we're going to do? Can I, do I trust you? Do I trust that you're going to do that? Do I trust the numbers that are going on? But once I get all these things together, then in the middle, finally I can bring in tools. I can automate some of those processes. So how do you do that? I've told you all the, the gloom of reality about how the who's who of companies that I've worked with around the world fall into these traps I just showed. 
So how do we fix it? And the way we do it is through integrated business planning. It used to be called sales and operations planning, so a lot of you students, I think that's in your textbooks, is talking about SNOP, sales and operations planning. We've now changed the name to be more of an integrated business planning. The name makes more sense. But here's a definition, just kind of focus on the red, saying it's, first of all, it's led by senior management. That's the highest levels of the company lead this process. What we found is if they don't own it, they delegate it down to mid-management, then the senior guys tend to override what the decisions are, and then all bets are off. So we're saying the executives of the company have to own the integrated business planning or IBP process. They're going to look at things about their products. What products are we selling? What are new products? What pr products are we going to get rid of? They're, or services. What's the demand? What, how much supply do I need to satisfy those? And when do I need the supply? When do I need to get the raw material? When do I need to organize transportation? What's my financial plans behind it? I want it to be on a monthly basis. I want to review all these, and I want to make sure everything's integrated with each other. So I've got, if I've got new product launches, I want to see that there's demand for it. I want to see that there's supply for it. And I want to make sure that I'm making money off of it through financial evaluations. And the executives own it and all agree to it. And we want to review it monthly, not at a detailed level, but at an aggregate level, so we could try to find if there's anything disconnected, anything wrong. For example, a product launch might be coming out late. We, let the, we need to let everyone else know that that's going to happen. And also, we want it to be long range. And we're saying, you need to look at this aggregate level a lot of times two years out. I was uh, working with Warehouser Corporation, you know, the timber corporation up in Washington. They do this 32 years out because that's how long it takes to grow a tree. So they plan 32 years out. Working with Intel Corporation, they go out 10 years on something that has a shelf life typically of less than three months. And they've got to try to predict what's the next tech technology. And what I just read this week, Apple's thinking about taking and getting rid of Intel, the Intel chips out of their iPads and all that and producing their own. Well, that's got to raise a lot of issues with Intel. And you've got to be reinventing yourself. I know Sam Walton used to say, if you've always done it that way, it's probably wrong. So they're constantly reviewing themselves. Lots of companies, Procter & Gamble goes three years out on this process. So we want to come down to consensus, the decision-making process, have a single plan, one set of numbers. People are, executives are held accountable. And the whole thing is to satisfy our customers and make money at the same time. So here's a model, kind of talks about these reviews on a monthly basis. But we got our product review, normally occurs in the first part of the month, to a demand review, to a supply review, doing financial assessments all along the way, saying financially, do these decisions make sense? We might have integration issues that we have to reconcile. There might be someone's got an issue because supply can't manufacture something, they don't have the the manufacturing capacity, the capability. They might not have the raw material to do it. Um, might be that product is, like I said, might be behind a launch. And then that all reports up to the management business review, and that's where the CEO sits, the executive sit. And we want the CEO really focused on their strategy. We don't want the CEO presidents on the floor over there trying to get product out the door. And I've seen that. I've seen the CEO going from cubicle to cubicle and fighting fires and yelling fire, 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 uh, where they actually should be the ones that are thinking three years, five years out to say, hey, I think this uh, e-commerce or this online shopping is really something. And you go look at online shopping, you know, like, uh, 
I think it was Walmart or, or Toys R Us or whatever, you know, 40% of their shopping is actually done online. And so you kind of look at it like, hey, they're not the Amazons out there, but yet they still have a, a big Am uh, electronic shopping uh, presence out there. And they're seeing that growing and growing. And we need to see what's going on because as we change, it's changing our formats. So just like Amazon's thinking about getting brick and mortar stores, even Walmart's the saying, hey, my footprint are these smaller stores now, like you see here in Springfield, the grocery stores. You're starting to see more and more of those pop up versus the gigantic super centers. But these executives, they're thinking about this stuff three years, four years, five years out. And that's what a lot of people in business have to look at too. We don't want the executives trying to get product out the door. That's not their job. I worked with the consultant, George Palmatier. He had a great quote. He said, if you got two people doing the same job, fire the one that makes the most money. And I thought, makes sense. If I got the CEO trying to get product out the door, fire him. Because he makes too much money for doing what he's doing. So now if we spread this down a little bit, we say that IVP, the executives are at an aggregate level, monthly. We don't want them looking at detail individual products for a particular store. But when we get below this line, this is details. We are going to do detail scheduling, you know, production floor scheduling. We are going to do you know, individual replenishment. That's down below the line here. But where we end up having the arguments in this model has to do with who owns these processes. So if I go over here to the product management review, we'll say, well, who owns product management? We say the highest level person in that division or that company, uh, vice president, senior vice president, whoever, might be in charge of product development, might be marketing that owns that area, but we want the top dog in charge of this whole process of what products do we have out, what's our portfolio, what products are we going to sell, when are we going to sell them, when do I have to make adjustments. You know, 50% of the products at a Walmart are considered new every year. Might be new packaging, new and improved, but they're still considered a new product, yet that could be a hiccup that could cause a bullwhip effect because now it's different. And so how do we handle that? So we have that. The biggest argument we have is who owns demand? Who's the demand owner? So the, who owns the consumer demand for the products? My customer. If I, I'm Procter & Gamble and I sell to Walmart, who owns that demand plan? Who's the highest level executive that owns that demand plan? And the answer is the sales organization. Makes sense. But the vast majority of companies that we work with says, oh no, that supply chain owns the demand. And when we go in there, I'm going like, supply chain, what part of demand is in the term supply? And I was up in Kansas City a few years ago as a speaker at a conference uh, for an uh, organization, international organization called APEX. It's the Association of Production and Inventory Control Society. They must have had five or 6,000 people there at this conference. And I was in a room, auditorium, and had 500 people, and they all had those electronic uh, uh, scores. And so I asked them questions, and I asked them this question. Who owns, who owns the demand review? And here are all these certified people. They all had their you know, Six Sigma black belts, and they're highly certified through APEX exams and everything. And as close to 70% of them said the supply chain owns that. 10% says it's finance owns that. And only 20% said it was the sales organization. I'm going like, are you kidding? Who calls on the retailer? Who calls on the consumer? Who, who is out there selling that knows what the promotions are and the pricing and all that? And they didn't want sales involved. So right off the bat, when companies said, we can't forecast our demand, we're unique, I point him to this to say you've got the wrong department 
even in charge of that. So that's the sales organization, head of sales. Supply chain, manufacturing, operations, supply, uh, the supply chain does the supply review, and then that, these are their everyday things with procurement. They have their daily activities that add up to a monthly activity for that overall review. And then that's a decision making. So they might get up there and said, hey, I don't have the manufacturing capacity to make this product and I might make uh, some of these decisions months out versus a lot of companies said you can't plan our business more than 30 days out. And yet we talk about lead times. You know, I was at Tyson Foods down there. Their actual lead time for chickens is three years. Even though it takes 52 days to go from an egg to production, they'll have to make decisions three years out to determine how many laying hens they need and, and all their facilities and products. And so this review process says it's decision making. When we have yellows or red flags coming up, we can make decisions several months out and be proactive and hopefully stay away from firefighting all the time where we're doing short-term detailed planning that we're surprised all the time because we're all on different numbers. If you do this, and you know, I mentioned like Procter & Gamble is a great example of a company that does this well, and there's several other companies that do this throughout the world, but if you do this, this is, tends to be the, the benefits that they get. You know, from improved forecast accuracy, which is normally the most, the times I get called in to consult companies, that's probably the number one issue they've got is they can't forecast their demand, so they don't really know how much to make or how much to ship. And like I said, that's typically because they have the wrong ownership of it, the wrong processes for it. But you can see these huge, huge, uh, Production, I mean, huge benefits financially to companies, a lot less firefighting as we go forward. So then when I joined Walmart in 1992, I started this process uh, along with other people that I worked with at Walmart, so I didn't do it all on my own. But we called it, I told you earlier, called it vendor forecasting, and eventually, eventually it became the CPFR that Courtney had mentioned for collaboration. So the collaboration effort started in 1996. Uh, we first named our first pilot CFAR, which I really like the name CFAR for Collaborative Forecasting and Replenishment, where we would collaborate with our trading partners. We did a pilot with Warner Lambert on Listerine, uh, highly successful, presented the results at Harvard, uh, ended, ended up be, becoming an industry standard uh, where they changed the name from C, uh, CFAR to CPFR to say, hey, it's not just forecasting replenishment, but we need to look at planning. It could be new product planning. It could be logistics planning. I mean, it's like a, a lot of the online shopping sites now uh, are doing pass-through ordering. So you might order through Amazon, but Amazon's actually not the one shipping you the product. It could be a supplier of Amazon's is actually shipping you the product, but you don't know that. They'll still put it like in an Amazon box, for example. They started as industry guidelines or standards. We first called it a standard, and then one thing we discovered is there's nothing standard about a standard, so they call them guidelines. So we have those. We wanted to do uh, get critical mass if we could get even Walmart's competitors, get Target, Best Buy, get their competitors to all also do this, then for manufacturing suppliers, if they can get at least 50% of their key re retailers to do this, then they can really optimize their manufacturing production. This is a laundry list of companies that were part of that industry standard. I'm not gonna read them to you, but you see them. There are some pretty major corporations that were all involved in this uh, committee. Their mission statement, simple change the relationship between our trading partners to create substantially more accurate information and drive value for greater sales and profits. Organize common sense, I call it. It's just common sense. We're going to actually work together. We're going to have a win-win partnership versus I win, you figure out how to win. You know, so 
Can we change the behaviors? Because this is issues. Changing the behaviors, doing this between trading partners, it's hard to do, even though it's simple. Can we do joint business plans? Can we plan things like Christmas or holidays? Can we plan events together, advertising? Can we have common goals, metrics? Can we agree to collaborate together? Can we agree on our behavior and how we work together as we do that? Unfortunately, when you have a committee of a lot of companies, we tend to add complexity to everything. This is their simple chart. You should have seen the first one. First one was a flow chart, you know where that little mouse was, a miracle happens here? That was the first chart. We went and put this chart together because, well, a circle, that's a warmer, fuzzier feeling. But the most important part is we put the consumer in the middle, the end consumer. We're no longer just focused on the distribution center or in my own area. I'm actually focused on you guys. What's your demand? What do you want to buy? What are you going to buy? What are you going to buy next year, two years from now? What's that new product? So as we focus on the consumer in a collaborative manner, then I can go do that joint business planning. I could go work together to improve my forecast of demand together. Because what happens is a Walmart, for example, forecast demand, but so does Walmart suppliers. They can get together and compare their forecasts in a collaboration environment and say, why is our demand off by 30%? And they can talk that through and then collaborate to come up with an agreed to plan that they can execute in the extended supply chain. Logistics, performance measurements, scorecards. You can do a lot with it. You can do flex be very flexible. You don't have to do it all, you can just do one part. A simplified way of how to do it is first educate each other. Let me teach you about my supply chain. When I was working with Tyson, I was helping them in Wendy's, Wendy's hamburgers on their chicken, chicken sandwiches. And Wendy's over there running promotions a lot of times on their spicy chicken sandwiches and all that, but not telling Tyson's they're about to do that. And Tyson's and them got together and said, well, why don't we educate each other about our supply chain and how we do demand planning and how we do these various things. And that's when Tyson's came and kind of opened the eyes up at the Wendy's guys saying, well, you know, our, our thing is, is we have to make decisions 52 days out whether or not we break eggs or not. Or we have to make decisions three years out to say, hey, chicken is starting to sell a lot more than beef. And so maybe three years out, I need to start building facilities to raise more chickens. So it happens in, in all industries. I was with the, the uh, Blackberry Corporation, and they're working with Vodafone and, and uh, AT&T and Verizon and looking at all the various launches and, and promotional plans. You know, get two for one on my phone. And Blackberry at the time was called Research in Motion. They didn't even know about the promotions. And all of a sudden, they're seeing it on TV, these advertisements for two-for-one phones. And they didn't even know about it, yet their supply chain, their lead times to get it is months. Because they have component manufacturers all over the world that are making this, and no one knows about a promotion that's hitting the street on Monday. You have huge disconnects. The bullwhip going crazy. Firefighting going wild. So once we can educate our on our flows, our promotional plans, our new products, then we can decide what information to share. It's all proprietary. I don't want this information to go out to everybody. So I'm gonna be real careful on who I share it with, when I share it, how I share it, how I'm gonna protect it, because I don't want that information to get out to my competitors. So we have to make sure we all agree on who gets it. I don't want everyone to get it. I want to make sure we agree on who gets it, and then we're going to go start collaborating and executing it. Different forms of collaboration. It could be as simple as basic data sharing. I'm not really going to collaborate with you. I'm just going to share information with you. Hey, let's collaborate on a forecast. 
Maybe we could collaborate actually on the consumption or planned orders, or we could go up there all the way to business planning that says, hey, I want to really optimize the supply chain. I want to do a lot of other stuff. Walmart has a building down there in Bentonville I saw a few months ago called the Collaboration Center, four-story high building that they really work on a lot of different other areas of collaboration, not just what I've been talking to you about. Big benefits. So you take these benefits, you take the ones from integrated business planning, and you really start to see financial gains as well as the fact that we're smoothing the bow web. Now, the last committee I chaired for the Voluntary Inter-Industry Commerce Solutions was the integration of IVP with CPFR. What we first saw here was the, what we call the pitch and the catch. You can be one trading partner that sh you're sharing information through the internet to the other, but if that trading partner doesn't have a catcher's mitt to internalize that, then you can't do this. And what we have is behaviors here because some companies say the only ones with the catchers mid at our company is the sales organization, and the sales organization says, I'm not allowed to share that with anyone else in my company because that's all proprietary. We're going, no, we want you to share this with manufacturing and product development and marketing and finance. We do want it protected. We do want to put security around that. But it's important that you have a catcher's mitt into your internal IVP processes. So time frame, typically IVP, I said here, one to two years out, could go 30 years out, depending on what your industry is, 10 years, three years. But normally two years is the minimum we'd like to see. Where CPFR is normally a year out. It'll be detailed in the short term, like one to three months out, we could be down to an item level. Three to 12 months out could be a, at a product family level or an aggregate level, might be at a month level. But when I get down to execution, I'll be down into the detail level. But the benefits is, is if we collaborate and I have my own house in order, then I'm going to have a lot more accurate demand forecast. And what we have to do is we have to cover our forecasting sins with excess inventory, with safety stocks with additional lead times. So the more accurate my demand forecast, the more efficient my operations are going to be when I use that. So anyway, smoothing the retail bullwhip was the ultimate vision that we had and goal as we went there. This was a, after that uh, committee got finished, Walmart came out, sent this to their suppliers saying, hey, First of all, we want you to, it, to adopt IVP within your companies. Because if you don't have a catcher's mitt, then I can't collaborate with you. So first go out, develop IVP, come along, collaborate with me. We'll make that information even more powerful, more accurate. We'll execute to that. Then we go to the extended supply chain. So I worked with Nike went all the way to Vietnam to their factories there. We showed this to suppliers of rubber, leather, shoelaces, say, what could we do if we start sharing information like this two years out, three years out on what we think our products are going to do overall demand? We might not know what individual tennis shoes or running shoes we're going to sell three years from now. But at an aggregate level, this is what I think my demand for rubber will be. And so we start integrating this even with suppliers. I worked on a process over in Switzerland that had DHL working with Ecotech out of Hungary, working with the Swiss phone company and Swiss voice out of Hosell as we worked on these processes, trying to optimize and synchronize our entire end-to-end -end supply chain trying to smooth that bull whip, try to get that waste out, try to reduce firefighting. I'm going to, I only say reduce firefighting because we're still going to have, things are going to hiccup. Things are going to happen. We're not going to eliminate it. But if I can at least reduce it, it's sure going to make life a lot easier, sustain, sustainability a lot better as we go forward. So collaborative challenges, the number one failure 
is the top one, trust. If I don't trust you, if you said you're going to do something and then you change your mind, I'm not going to trust you anymore. If I don't trust the data, all bets are off. Because I'm kind of taking a, a chance here that what you're telling me is what you're going to do. But if all of a sudden I ship you a product that we had collaborated that you wanted and then you cancel it and say, sorry, I don't need it anymore, and I'm left holding the bag, I'm not going to do this with you anymore. So the number one failure of this is the lack of trust. We have to have the executives support it because they're normally the guys that override it. If it turns out to be a mid-management process, you know, Kraft, this happened at Kraft. Kraft had it at an executive level, and then as time went on, they went and pushed it down, pushed it down. Pretty soon the executives would override it, said, oh, we're not making our numbers, we're going to surprise Wall Street, so I want you to go ahead and do this, go ahead and do this, even though the process was working fine and they had their demand numbers were right, they just overrode it. So now they had to relaunch it a couple of years ago and it's back up at the executive level and working really well. You will have those cultural issues, change management, organization, getting rid of those silos, doing what was promised, and having a win-win partnership versus I win, you figure out how to win. So my last slide here, and this is a real key one, but this is change management. This is behaviors. This is something that we can't teach you in school. This is something that when you go out in the real world, you should keep this in front of you. Do what you said you're going to do. If I said I'm going to deliver this, deliver it. Do not promise more than you can de deliver. Don't surprise people and say, oh, surprise. You know, Walmart just put out fines last year for companies who had customer service levels, also known on time and full, that if you're under a certain percentage, a lot of their suppliers were under 50%, and a lot of them were under 70%. And they're going like, why aren't you 100%? You promised me that, so they started having to apply fines because they'd open up the back doors of the trucks and say, hey, this isn't what I ordered, it's half of what I ordered. And Walmart executing as it's doing, you know, that was a huge hiccup. And being out of stocks in retail is the biggest sin you can have. You never want to be out of stock in retail. Play your position. If you can't do it, you know, deliver what you promise or communicate if you can't. Play your position. Open and honest communications. Give me the bad news early. Don't shoot the guy that told you. Don't shoot the messenger. It's a replanning process. So every month, I update my rolling forecast for the next two years. I found companies I was working with that come December, they've only got one more month of forecast. And then in January, they're going to roll out another year. And I'm going, well, what are you going to make in December or January? Because you don't have a request for product for a forecast. Well, we'll just take care of that later. So it's a replanning process. One set of numbers, and once again, the trust issue. All right, well, that's all I got. Thanks for your attention. Are there any questions or anything? Okay. Thanks. Any questions? Awesome. Thanks for your time. Bye. Oh, you got one? Oh, well. oh, we do have a question. Hello. Hi. I was just wondering what you thought the impact that artificial intelligence might have on, um, on yeah. supply chain and everything. Sure. And and I think AI is fantastic. In fact, when I I had uh, a team of programmers worked for me at Walmart, and I had uh, a couple of those guys. That's what they did was artificial intelligence back in the 90s, and we also had a contractor out there. And so artificial intelligence allowed us to actually manage better at that 
lower level. So when you're dealing with 150 million store item com combinations, uh, using artificial intelligence was great because you could do pattern recognition. You could use uh, uh, models, whether it's case-based reasoning or whatever, to try to model that. So it's a great tool. And, but once again, it's a tool. And so unless you have the people processes and all together, then the tool's a tool. But if you have the other together, then it's a great tool, and I'm a strong supporter of it. And uh, I think uh, it's really going to take off. But we got to get the people processes down first. So, so sorry, follow-up question. Um, do you feel that with the advent of AI and, and the growing importance of it, do you feel that the tool is going to gradually become more important than the processes or the people? No, I never think the tool will ever be more important than the processes. I think it's still people, people issues, that's going to be the thing, that they're, they're the ones that can still change things or their behavior can be really bad. And, and we see it. We see it no matter where we're at, that people can sometimes not behave properly or not play that position. And so it doesn't matter what kind of tool I have uh, if people override it. I do think AI can play a much more important role and make things easier for people. Uh, makes it even more important that we get our processes aligned to work with that tool. Great, thank you. Uh, any others? All right. Oh, got one? No? All right, well, thanks for sticking around. Appreciate it.